Okay, it's 2.30 now, so we'll get started with this next speaker. Um, this is Dr. Gustavo Silva, and he obtained his DVM in Brazil in 2009, and then he worked for a company providing technical services in swine health and production. And from 2012 to 2018, he obtained his master's and PhD in applied veterinary epidemiology. He also did a postdoc at ISU in 2018 before joining Carthage Innovative Swine Solutions, where he worked as a research scientist. And then in January 2021, he returned to Iowa State and currently serves as assistant professor in the Department of Veterinary Diagnostic and Production Animal Medicine. Thank you. Yep, thank you. Yep. So would like to thank the opportunity to show you guys what our group has been doing in terms of PERS. So uh, thank you, Dr. Ross, as well, and the, the, com the, the committee to, to, have, have, to let us share some recent findings here. So today, uh, we'll focus on moni PERS monitoring, control, and prevention and some of the work that we did or we have been doing and that are uh, field applications for you guys. So we start with just a brief overview and then we'll jump to the recent findings and then uh, highlight some of the conclusions and what we need to do or at least what are the directions that we need to go. So here, just overview, PERS is not new. Uh, PERS was first uh, diagnosed in 1989. And since there, the things are still a little bit the same. We are still learning how to deal with the virus. We are still learning how the virus is changing over time. But basically, uh, the disease is characterized by a severe reproductive and respiratory disease, both at the salt farm and grow finished pigs but also huge economic impact when we sum all these uh, uh, production losses. And in 2013, Dr. Holtkamp, uh, he developed an economic model, an enterprise budget model to estimate the economic impact of PERS in the United States. And by that time, the economic losses were, was near 64 million hundred million thousand dollars so a lot of money and we still are still and we are still learning how to deal with this virus until that time and then year after year as as well the pattern remains the same today there are two big uh monitoring projects in in the u.s the morrison uh, swine health monitoring system that monitors uh, swine breeding herds, the status of the PERS over time from the University of Minnesota, and also the swine disease reporting system here uh, that is led by Dr. Uh, Giovanni Trevisan at Iowa State. So SDRS here, our, our in-house uh, monitoring project, they gather information from the major veterinary diagnostic labs to understand what's going on over there in terms of the major uh, disease here in the US. And then here, the first chat is just to make the point here, data from the, the University of Minnesota folks. So here, the, the program over there starts uh, s since 2009, and they, they break this down by what we call per season. So a per season starts in July 1st and then go to the end of June of the next year. But the point is simple. Every year, at least 21% of the sow breeding herds in the United States have a PERS outbreak. And then when we combine that information over time and also with the data that Giovanni has been put together in these past years, we can make the same point. And we know when that happens. So every year we have a significant increase in the number of outbreaks and that occurs in a cyclic way. So we start it's starting in the middle of August and then goes by the end of the winter. So the, the pattern remains the same. And when we think about how we could minimize losses due to PERS, I believe the, the swine industry has been done a tremendous job and monitoring tools. So what that means is that we have a, a better understanding of how the virus moves around, how the virus can sustain a herd, how much time it, it takes to 
to, to win negative peaks, but also with the advances in diagnostics and what we call today as a population samples also highlights uh, our inability to fight the, the, these, these virus. So for example, study published by Dr. Linares in 2014 showed that the time, usually after an outbreak, the time that a herd take to win negative pigs would take between 35 to 40 weeks. Now we have other monitoring tools like processing fluids, and I will show you guys a little bit later. Uh, and at least from the data that we have seen from collaborators in the industry, it, we, we, so far we have not seen a herd that, that win negative peaks with less than a year. So more we advance in diagnostics, more unfortunately we understand that we don't really understand what's going on with PERS, right? But also one thing that we made a huge advance as well is based on control methods and the utilization of vaccines to decrease the economic losses. And then I will show you guys a lot of data that we, are, uh, that we did field studies describing those. But I, I believe one of, the huge, uh, one of the huge advances that we did uh, in the past years was related to biosecurity and the things that we have been doing different. And then when we combine PERS and PD together, due to PD in the first appearance in 2013, we, we made huge uh, improvements on uh, biosecurity. And then that is one of the last topics that I will share with you guys, some tools that we developed to understand what are the key biosecurity things that decrease the time, the, the probability of uh, an outbreak. So my whole object here today is just to share with you guys what we did and what we have been doing. And, till, and, and, and more specifically for today, I select the things that are applicable to the field and then things that we did with real data. So regarding monitoring, let's start with what we, what we called processing fluids. I don't know if everybody is familiar with this, but when we process the liters at the ferry room around five days of age, uh, we usually, we, we, we let, we, when processing, we took that testicles and tails, and then the remaining fluid of that, we, we, we squeeze and get, we squeeze and we get a fluid, and then we would test that for any disease to understand what's going on in the herd. So that is what called a processing fluids. And based on, and then based on work that we have been doing, we, ha we did and we submitted, we can see here, you guys, with this plot in the right, that it's a very sensitive technique. So we really can, we, we can detect PERS virus even with, when we combine a lot of pigs together. So this paper uh, submitted by, by Dr. Uh, Will, Will Lopez, we can see, see here that if we combine three, 323 pigs in one sample with one, po one, one positive pig with a moderate CQ value, we have a 93% probability of detection. So if we divide, divide by this by 10, more or less, so let's see that the, let's say that for example, the number of the, the size of the liter is 10 pigs, we can more or less pull 40 liters and then we can still understand what are the diseases more specific in this time, if per purse it's in that population or not. So a very sensitive technique. And here, just an example or an application this and try to understand the economic losses associated of the, the how much what the vir virus pressure or the virus concentration in that, in that, in that liter. You can see that here, uh, uh, work done by Dr. Giovanni Trevisan, and then he followed, uh, he had 121 cohorts of nursery pigs, so all the pigs in the herd, they were moved to a single source nursery, and then we classified that uh, nursery, that nursery flow by a CQ value, so by processing fluid. So we go there, we took one processing fluid that was representative of that population, and then we try to understand if CT, if CT or if PERS exposure and what are the, the quantity of, of virus ongoing there, 
really matters. And we can see here, for example, that here is in this first plot in the left is just an idea of the distribution. So we have uh, low, low uh, seven, seven flows with characterized by low CT that was under 27. So CQ, so in this interpretation of CQ, higher the number, more virus they have in that, in that sample. So, and then when we, we assess it, the difference between groups here in the second plot in the right, we can see that lower the number of the CQ value, higher the mortality between nursery, uh, between the nursery groups. So CQ matters and there is a clear association on lower the CT value of the processing fluid, higher the expected mortality in the flows. And then another advance that we have been working with, it's what we call family oral fluid. So long story short, a lot of producers like to understand uh, the status of the pigs at the time of processing, so four days of age, but also different producers like to understand actually the prevalence of those same pigs at weaning. So usually that will be done by collecting blood serum samples from those pigs. Usually they, they collect 30 serum samples and then they pull that to understand the prevalence of that population. But then uh, Dr. Marcelo Almeida has done a lot of work on this one to try to develop new ways to also detect if the virus isn't going at the farm. He, he, de he developed what we call a uh, family oral fluids that will be a modified oral fluids, but getting uh, oral fluids both from the soils and the pigs. And then the pigs and the soils will chew in that hole, and then we will squeeze, get the fluid, and test that hole. So by that, uh, so far we have been a very good correlation between what we call the liter prevalence and the pig prevalence. And this was done by going a liter, bleed all the pigs, try to understand the prevalence of the litter, and also collect the femoral fluid. So a lot of more work to come, but at least so far show a very good tool that we can use. And also compared to what we call a labor, it's very, it's less labor intensive because we don't need to go there and take the pigs and bleed and all that kind of stuff. So more to come on this. However, not all farms use a uh, diagnostic test to assess what's going on. So a few years ago, we, we had the question, so what if we use some key production indicators and monitor that over time to understand if there is anything there? So what we end up doing, uh, we monitor a lot of those KPIs over time, sorry. And here is example one, is one example where by using a, a statistical process control method, more specific uh, exponential moving average, uh, we establish a baseline of the herd and here we are uh, using a number of aborts per week and this can be done in real time today because most of the herds collect uh, real time data and this is the next step that we are going now. So we monitor the weekly number of, uh, number of abortions and then we cross that, merge that information with the status of the farm. So they were doing diagnostic collection to understand if there were spurs or not. But then uh, when, 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 when they, they got, for example, a purse positive results by diagnostics, actually we were able in some of the cases detect early by the number of aborts that the number was out of expected. So we were able to detect or identify some sources that PERS was around up to four weeks before uh, the outbreak was detected by diagnostic. Why? Because sometimes when we go and we talk with uh, the guys at the field, they two things that they usually tell us that are the triggers of disease. One is saw a feed and then the other is the number of aborts. So just trying to detect, or not detect early because I don't think that it's the correct definition, but detect in a time, timely manner, go there, and just to trick di diagnostics is a very use of monitoring, uh, ongoing monitoring of production data that can help because it's some data that you guys are at collected every day, right? 
And the other question that uh, we were trying to answer here more specific was what if we set production thresholds? Because usually at the barn level, people don't have uh, resources that they can use advanced statistics. So what if we establish a metric or if we establish a magic number that most likely of the case will trigger that something is wrong? So what we end up doing, we, we took fi 58 outbreaks from different farms and tried to correct for everything. So size of the farm, type of the first virus, uh, number of weeks that took them to identify that ongoing virus. And by that, we, 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 we were trying to understand if we could establish that key metrics that here in the case was number of aborts, aborts per thousand cells that we could use to trigger some investigations. And then here is the table showing that usually when we have one spike and we use one week, the first week, and then when we establish 2.1 2 aborts per thousand cells, we have a sensitivity of correct classifying a PERS virus as a as, as an outbreak in 81%. And when we, we use a two-week average, we had 84.7%. So this is just to trigger just numbers that people at the barn level when doing shorts, they, they say, hey, we have X many aborts per day, it's something wrong. I don't know, but maybe sometimes it's just the, the trigger that you really need to go and understand if you need to take samples or not. Just barn level tools that you, you, we can use and it's what we call easy numbers that you can have in mind. So this is the same information. And what about control? So now I would like to share with you guys some results related to studies done at the soil farm level and, uh, and also measuring performance at both nursery and or the wing to finish phase. So the first here uh, is just one, one, one program that we called uh, POMP. So it will be PERS Outbreak Managed Program. So it, this is basically uh, what, the, what the human medicine has done. So those big studies that they try to understand key drivers of health. But here we are just trying to understand once the farm has an outbreak, what they do. And then if they do something different, we may see different uh, impact on their production data, right? So the idea here is just to take a lot of information, combine with diagnostic data, share performance, monitor of the farm, and on top of that, do some whole genome sequencing diagnostics just to understand uh, what's going on and try to be able to compare the farms. So, so far we have 27 herds, it's not, it's, it's not a lot, we are just in the beginning of this project, but some of key things we have been seeing just to try to understand and try to explain wh why we don't have a lot of advances in terms of elim PERS elimination, because you guys will see here that we do a lot of things different and maybe that is just an eye-opening to try to understand and do some more uh, research on that area. So here, just based on these 27 herds here, just uh, very descriptive th that of these 27 herds, to most of them were not naive herds, was farmed that, w that was spurs stable and then had an outbreak. The herd closure here is still uh, adopted by the most of the farms so most most farms in the new most farms that are under this project so very biased sample is still doing herd closure to try to control eliminate purse and few of them adopted wean down so what it's wean down so when you have an outbreak you just wean all the pigs off the soils to try to decrease the pressure of the disease that are circulating in the farrowing room okay so the big picture of these and key take homes here are these two next, ne next graphs and then the next slide. So here is just to try to understand when you have an outbreak and you do a whole herd exposure program, what you do. So there's a lot of difference. So I, I count here is 10 different ways that people expose salts. 
And if we are doing things different, I don't think that we, ha we have a lot of difference in the results, right? And the same here for the guilt acclimation program, a lot of things. We don't have any consensus in the swine industry. And maybe this is something that maybe we, we need to reevaluate as well. And here is just a, a graph that Dr. Giovanni put together as well, just to try to understand. So one of, remember that one of the things that I mentioned to you guys regarding diagnostics is, is more we have advanced the diagnostics, more we learn that we may not know a lot of things that we believe that we, we knew before. So here, for example, imagine that we, this is a herd so first line here is the reference strain here for the when the farm had an outbreak, collect samples and this is the, the strain of the farm. So the reference of strain of the outbreak. And then this is by whole genome sequencing. And then as time goes, we collect more herds. And then if we use a difference here, F1%, to classify that same that same virus that we have been isolating throughout the time if it's green it's because that it's a similar strain right so based on work that others did so if you have a, a new a virus that is one diff one percent difference based on the genome you you can say that it's the same virus but then when we go further we can see here that in this day here we already have two different virus that was detected in the same herd. So two different virus in the same herd. And as we go here, we have more different virus in the same herd ongoing. What's happening? <laughs> I don't know. I just know that there's a lot of more virus than we, than we know ongoing in the herd. And we have no idea where, where this came from. More you test, more you find, more we, we find, more we are trying to answer those, those questions later. But it's just something interesting, right? I mean, 10 years ago, if you show this, something, you're, you, some, somebody will say to you, you are crazy. There's only one virus ongoing in my farm. No, there's three actually. And if we count here, there's more than four. And this is just six months after the outbreak. So what a lot of that can be driving for a different things, different vaccines be using, area spread, all that kind of stuff. And we're still learning all these things. So new things to come, but it's interesting to understand how much we learn about virus, right? And about more specifically about the PERS virus. So moving forward with control, so use of vaccines to control the herd. So here we, we will present to you guys two, two, two projects done by Cesar Mora. So one of, one of them was just, to, so a lot of herds, when they are in, 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 in areas that has a lot of virus pressure, they usually do quarterly vac mass vaccination of the salt farms. And one of the questions that a collaborator asked us was, if I'm doing this quarterly vaccination, what is the impact on the downstream? So I'm vaccinating these this cells four times a year, or sometimes three, sometimes two, depend the, the, depend the, 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 how the, depending on the production system, but what is the impact of that in the downstream performance? So Cesar put together a trial, so he gathered data from 37 farms, and then he split every three weeks. He, he did, uh, he separate as a group to try to understand going forward what was the impact of the mass vaccination at the salt farm in the nursery performance. So here he has the baseline group in the first one, so 90, 99 batches. And then as the time goes, every three weeks, it's an, a different group category by age after the mass vaccination that he compare the performance. So here, overall, we do see a, diff a little different in the mortality rate after the mass vaccination. But we do not see a difference, but, more, so sorry, mortality rate, we, we have a difference even after, after he will be 12 week, weeks after the mass vaccination, we still have some um, increase in mortality. We'll, here will be up to 1%. 
and then related to average daily gain, we just see a difference in the first week in the first group after the mass vaccination, but then down the road, we do not have any impact on average daily gain. So has no major consequences, depending how much you consider as a mortality rate, if a difference of 1%, half percent. And then the other questions, and, the, and it's something that it's a lot of used today by the swine industry, is the use of half dose against the full dose. So then Cesar put together as well a quasi-experimental trial to try to understand this. So he has data from three different farms, and he has blocks of half doses, and then full doses, and then he flipped that, he flipped that order to try to understand if there was differences in related to nursery performance. Comparing groups with half dose or full half dose. And this most of this work with modified live virus vaccines, so L MLV vaccines. So regarding the performance results related to mortality, we do not have in this scenario, right? So this in this scenario, it may be different. If you go, for example, with a high dense area, you may have different results. But under the, under the condition of this, this study, we do not have any difference in mortality between those groups. We had a difference in average daily gain between those groups, half dose or full dose vaccinated. And then we, have, we, ha we do not have a difference in feed conversion as well for those groups in the nursery phase. Some people may ask if this average, if this average difference would maintain the win to finish phase. My answer is we do not have the data to look at because after that, after the nursery, they commingle the flows in. We, we lost track of that. But during the nursery phase, that was the case. And then we plug those numbers in a benefit cost analysis to understand what that extra cost of, if, if for example, you have a full dose and you go to the half dose, what would that, that be in difference of terms in cost? So here, uh, you, you have a profit, net profit here, based on just on performance, right, of $10,000, just related here for 10,000 pigs. And then you have a difference in extra labor and cost of the vaccine. If you are under a half dose and if you go to a full dose, you have this difference in cost. And the benefit cost ratio of full dose is 2.1. And then this is relative by, this is just assuming the fixed cost of a wind pig and feed cost. But then we did some sensitivity analysis as well, just to try to understand in that circumstances, how much would be and what is the ballpark that you are looking for. So here we have the vaccine cost, and then we, we have the marginal pig price. So you can see that when you have a better price of the pig, your, you increase your benefit, your cost ratio by a lot. So this is helpful because when you are thinking that you need to sell pigs maybe six months later, it's a good thing to try to understand what the market are, to try to understand if it makes sense or not to make those decisions regarding half dose or full dose. But it's just something that we can, we can understand better with this type of trial. What about prevention? When we think about prevention, we think about biosecurity. And then one of the things that we have been developing is just to try, uh, to, I try to understand what the herds that don't have an outbreak do compared to the herds that the outbreak, that they, ha they have an outbreak, for example, every year or they, they have. So we, we put a lot of data together to develop a tool to try to estimate the probability of these herds have an outbreak based on the location that they are, the bio biosecurity practices that they do, and the, the movement data that they have related to connections to other farms. So the outcome here was we were comparing farms that 
that reported no outbreak compared to farms that reported at least a not one outbreak. And then we use some machine learning methods just to try to learn from the data, to try to segregate those key biosecurity practices that more likely contribute to the PERS outbreak. And then we develop two tools, one, tools, one tool with 20 questions and another tool with two questions. So in this plot here, both, so farms in red are the farms that report at least one outbreak. And here farms in dark or black is the farms that do not report an outbreak. So here in the first here, we went from 346 variables and use just 20 variables to create this score. And we have an accuracy of 76% and a, and a sensitivity of 86% to really detect and classify a herd that had an outbreak with just 20, 20 variables. This is just as helpful, just if you don't have time to fool those surveys that took three hours, you just go and fill 20, 20, 20 questions and then from there you have uh, understand a little bit of your uh, probability of having an outbreak. Just, it's just, just a simple tool just to understand where you are at and then if you can compare your farms and you can change anything that is highly associated with uh, the disease outbreak. And then when we reduce that to six questions, we improve our performance. So our accuracy was up to 80% and the sensitivity remained the same. But now just asking three questions. So instead of going there and ask 346, we can ask 20 or even we can, can ask six questions and then we can develop you a nice score uh, that is associated with if you are going to have an outbreak or not. So here are the key results based on that six questions, okay? So nothing new. So number of sites that share the same breeding replacement trailer as the number of sites that share the same, the, the replacement trailer increase, the increase of the probability of having an outbreak. More, more frequently you remove salts from the salt farms, more probability you have an outbreak. This is just if you share birds positive pigs with same, with trailers that you you do re remove calls higher the probability and higher the frequency of handling higher the probability. So all the things related to connection at the sites and indirect measure of biosecurity, but because not every time you have people there to do this stuff. So have a lot of people coming back and forth from your farm and everybody needs to be in the same page to what, what they need to do or your chance of or probability of having an outbreak will increase. And here related to density and farm characteristics. So more than number of sites around your farm, three miles, more, more likely you have, more likely or higher the probability of having an outbreak, nothing new here. Commercial herds against uh, genetic or multiplier farms as well. Employee annual, annual turnover, higher the turnover higher the probability, so this is important, but it's nothing new, so you have a lot of turnover, you have to, to be on top of training all that people that will come to your farm every day. And that disposal method on site when compared to comp compared composting, incineration and handling has a higher probability of classified that farm of being, uh, being having an out outbreak next year. So, so far, take homes of all this presentation. Looking at the monitoring program, it seems that we make the same mistakes every year. So every year we have that increase uh, in the number of outbreaks during the winter. And it seems that this, that have been happening since PERS is around. We have failed on eradication programs. So we have not been very, uh, uh, very good to document good elimination plans and a lot of production system does things different and seems that the results are the same. But also there is a, a when we think about uh, areas that has a lot of swine density, 
sometimes just lack of collaboration between swine production companies because all of them, each of them have a different uh, business management and each of them they, they do and they make money in different ways, right? However, we have a very good new diagnostics and monitoring tools. We have advanced a lot on that. We have new strategies to control the virus. As we go forward, we learn more how to use vaccines and different type of vaccines that are available. And more effect biosecurity practices we have been having in the herds that has decreased the number of outbreaks going forward. With that, I would like to thank you, Dr. Jason Ross, for the opportunity, Stacy and also the Iowa Swine Day staff and our team here, Dr. Daniel Linares, Dr. Giovanni Trevisan, and the guys that really make these things works. With that, would we'll take any questions. Thank you.